My dad and his brother Gene used to, when they were younger, built model airplanes. They all were involved in model boats and model airplanes, things like that. Uh, building them with uh, little gas engines where they would actually fly. largest plane and storm center of a congressional inquiry awaits tests at its dock in Long Beach, California. Builder of the monster, Howard Hughes, stormy petrel of aviation, surveys the 320-foot wing of the Colossus, whose weight is 200 tons and whose length is 200 feet. Sections of the mammoth are as high as a five-story building. Mr. Hughes' descent gives you an idea. Hughes sits at the controls. The air giant starts to move driven by her eight 3,000 horsepower motors. And now for Mr. Hughes' surprise. As the enormous craft approaches her 95 mile an hour takeoff speed, the pilot lifts her onto the step and holds her there as she races through the choppy sea. 200 tons are airborne, five months ahead of time. 70 feet off the water, she stays for a mile. $23 million worth of airplane has answered a lot of committee questions. It can fly. I went into the restaurant and looked in the bar and, and on his pool table was this magnificent airplane. My grandfather took a trip to California and that's where he got the initial idea to start his plane because he had seen the actual flying boat. And they just went through Long Beach and saw this plane and that started it. And then he decided he wanted to build a remote control. He wanted it as detailed as a real one. Because lots of times he'd stay up all night working on it. You know, which wasn't good for his health, because he never got any sleep. Howard allowed one reporter to go on board with a tape machine and record everything that was going on. And Dad got a copy of that. Just by the sound of the recording, you can tell when they lift it off. Dad would have been proud. in 1971 and we had the uh, tile and carpet store That's right. and then we got the restaurant. On February 4th, 1978, we opened up a restaurant in Midland, Colorado and we called it Marvin's Gardens. We were in the restaurant business for 14 years. I think my dad started working on the plane in 1989. We went out to San Francisco with a friend to pick up a gyrocopter. And on the way back, they stopped at Burbank, and then they went on down to Long Beach and saw the spruce goose or the flying boat or whatever they call it, you know, and boy, that was just a thrill for him. Something between the plane and him, some kind of connection, he just absolutely adored this plane and the man who built it, Howard Hughes. I wanted to find out everything we could about Howard Hughes and um, the building of the plane. 
Yeah, I think he was fascinated by the way he lived, by the way he died. By it. The man was a mystery, I guess. He had bought from the gift store a plastic model of the flying boat. And it was Easter time, so our restaurant was closed, the family was home. Him and I got my mom's blender and made it plaster of Paris in her blender, which ruined it. But he poured plaster of Paris into this hollow plastic model and then let it harden and sliced it up and took it to a printing place to have it make his blueprints. Yeah, see right there? Yeah. That's, that's the size of that bottle. So Just cut it in sections and he drew it on paper and took it down and they blew it up and that was his pattern. That tells me that he has exploded that up about ten times. He progressed so fast after deciding this is what he wanted to do. I would say ten hours a day. At one point it got either more or less. Sometimes he would only work for a few hours and then get tired or but oh he just devoted all his hours, all his time to that plane. I know there's some nights he'd work into the middle of the morning if it was what was on his mind he would stay up and so people could drive by and I'm sure see him working in there the lights on at night. I saw just this grumpy old man come to life when he worked on his plane whether he was drawing the blueprints or cutting his fingers trying to get the balsa wood the right angle it did not matter because he enjoyed it. I remember one time when on one of our late night talks, my grandfather and I were at the bar, and he was like, you know what I'd really like to do? I'd like to make a museum. One week later, he came to the restaurant with this big grin on his face, and he was like, I got your museum for you, and he pulled out this huge orange poster that said Howard Hughes slash Wiley Post Pictorial Museum, and I couldn't believe it. I was like, oh my gosh, and he had at least a thousand pictures, and it took him three months but he got every single picture up in that restaurant. They were all over the place. And he hung his sign right there in the window. And I don't think I'd ever seen more tourists stop to see that because it was so unusual. Most of the customers we had were tourists. We had quite a few locals, but most were tourists who came through. And when they first saw the plane, they were just like, whoa. And they couldn't believe it. And they would ask to see the man who made it and they would just sit and talk to him forever. I mean they would come in to eat and forget all about it and just sit and talk with him. He could go on and on for hours to perfect strangers about his plane. He would be in the bar and if you were sitting in the restaurant you could hear a couple four letter words coming coming from the, that general direction and they would just they would know it was Marv and he must have cut his finger or messed up on something. It was no big deal. Everybody was accustomed to it because he was he cussed fairly often. When he got to the gluing process and he had to use the acrylics with like the overlay of the plane, mm -hmm. people couldn't eat because the fumes were so strong and my grandma finally said, you know, take it outside and he took it outside. There was at one time a little bit of, well we didn't really fight about it, but a little bit of friction or something because you know, doing something like that is expensive. So she was a little upset sometimes when he would go to his plane versus help her with the business. But as we went along and I got to see the the plane, you know, itself out there in Long Beach, then I understood why Marv wanted to do it. It was really interesting to just see how he made all those little the parts for it and carved out the seats and stuff in the cockpit by hand and everything. He had quite a bit of it done in 91 when the Boulder Data Camera came and did an article on him. He worked on his plane maybe four out of the nine years, if I had to say how much time he spent on it. He finally met a gentleman named Chuck Euchard who was like crew chief engineer on the flight that day with Howard Hughes. I guess designed and, and put together the hydraulics for the, the real one. Uh, well, he lived out in uh, Las Vegas. But Marv got his name through somebody else and just either called him or wrote him a letter. And they, he invited Marv to come out to meet him, and we did. And they became very good friends, almost like brothers. Chuck gave Marv a piece off of the real plane to put on his model. One of the 
proudest moments in my grandfather's life was when he took a trip out to the actual spruce goose and they had never let any visitor into the cockpit. It was off limits, but it was being torn down and moved to Oregon at that point. And the guy said, you know, Marv, you've been out here eight times and you come out every time and you never got to see it. When Bill found out they were going to tear it apart, uh, they, he called Marv on a Monday morning. He said, if you can be out here Wednesday morning, I'll let you go in. My dad and myself and two of his brothers supposedly are the only people other than the crew of Hughes that was ever on the real plane. And we went out there when it was in story or in exhibit at Long Beach and they opened the plane and we were on there for a couple hours. Okay. Now get up there and take a look. Hey, sure. Tony. Uh, too bad I wasn't outside. I could take him. You want to get up there behind him, Chuck, so you can tell him where? No end? Or what? Right. 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 Does he feel good? Oh, you know. Just to say I'm going to be here. We were able to climb anywhere inside that we wanted to, up in the tail, the wings. Um, took probably thousands of snapshots of the cockpits and things so he could get his plane as detailed as the original one. Actually, it was set up where we were able to go in before that day's exhibit opened. It had to be very early in the morning, and we only had so much time. But I would say it was a couple hours, but... <laughs> I'm sure he would have wanted to spend five or six more. My grandfather got to sit in that cockpit and just look at everything. He got to press the buttons just like a little child and he just had the best time of his life. And nothing would have made him happier except to fly that plane himself. It seemed like once he moved it from the restaurant out to the workshop garage, he didn't really work on it much. He lost a really good friend. Chuck Uecker. Chuck Uecker. And he was going to be Marvin's um, co-pilot when he flew mm -hmm. his remote. And, and he, he passed, passed away and it was just, it seemed like, I mean it hit my dad like a rock. He sold the restaurant, my mom and dad sold their business, retired to Nebraska. He built a huge 30 by 60 garage just for his plane. He built a very large garage and workshop at their home in Hebron that eventually the plane was going to sit there in a back room. Once he was done with it, he had plans to build a museum of all the pictures that he accumulated and the stuff. The majority of it would be Howard Hughes in the building of the original plane and probably pictures that he took of the different stages of the model. And then the end of the tour, so to speak, would be the plane itself setting in like back in the corner. Even before he met Chuck, he knew that he wanted to fly the plane. And he was getting ready to finish his airplane, and he passed away of a heart attack in March of from an airplane club contacted my mom and asked if she knew anything about the whereabouts of his plane. Uh, I'm Wendell Wickstrom and I met uh, 
Marvin Lewis up at his restaurant in Nederland. I, we started a search and found that uh, the airplane was in Nebraska and nothing has been done to it. Okay, this is Marvin Lewis's airplane in pieces. My mom put him and a man named Stephen Croft in touch with my grandmother. When I approached my mom with the idea of someone else finishing it that knew what they were doing and whatnot, um, she said, well, it doesn't matter to her if it took a couple years to finish because it would be getting done faster than if she had to do it herself. And they got together and made up a business arrangement that this club, they were going to finish my grandfather's plane. My name is Stephen Croft. I've been a member of the Boulder Air Modeling Society for over 25 years. The Boulder Air Modeling Society inherited this project. They talked to my mom and went out to Nebraska, picked it up. Under the provision that we go ahead and finish it. So they came out to Nebraska one day with this pickup truck and they loaded everything up and they just, they were like kids in a candy store running around my grandfather's garage because everything they needed to finish the plane was already there. The project now is in, in my basement and uh, about once a week we have volunteers come to uh, do some construction on the project. And hopefully um, they'll finish it and it will fly and Marvin will be part of that. He'll be inside with the plane. We uh, admire the dedication that Marvin Lewis went through on this project. Mr. Lewis had it 80 percent done with about 50 percent still to go and the 50 percent go is the finishing and the painting and the installing the radio and all that equipment in it.
everything oh. is just eight times worse than ordinary. My name is Glenn Miller. I'm getting ready to make a flap for the spruce goose. This unit here is a homemade hot wire foam cutter. Okay, heat is on. Take the weight off and let's see if it's going to cut this one the way it should. That is a much better cut. It turned out good. We now have the complete flap. We will put balsa wood skin over the top of this flap. When he gets ready to land, he will probably have flaps down, which will slow the airplane down. Hopefully, get it down safely. Look at this, gentlemen. What? Check it out. Do we have flap? We have flap. You hit the softens again. No. You got to sand that. You found the secret. You got to sand that. You have to run a line all the way from the center tank all the way out to this edge in here. What happens if we put the heat on there? Will that soften it? You hit the softens again. It's correct, and I think this one is the one that has to be tied off. Correct. You're exactly right. Well, I don't know if any place you might be able to find But anyhow, you put that, put that without alcohol, paint on Say, ah. Uh, no. Okay, rinse. <laughs> <laughs> yep, everything's high and dry in there. Good. We're in business. We've been working on it for what? Eight months? Put some like back on. Paintbrush painted on there. I haven't been able to find it. It's going to be interesting when you get all eight of these things going at one time. I think it would behoove us to have a test. As long as we do it about a week beforehand, so just in case if things go sour, we can have time to rebuild. Yeah. Are you going to make a test flight before the real day? No, probably not.
I see. And look at how he made the windows yeah, and poured resin. Yeah, they in look there. great. Isn't that amazing? Look at yeah. an ashtray. <laughs> <laughs> This is cover, right? Material we're going to cover this with. Eventually, we'll have that stuff on all, all of this. It's on glue on it, and it's heat shrinkable. And this is just a little iron made for that stuff. It's down on the amount of uh, painting necessary. It seals the wood, and it uh, adds some structural integrity to the yeah, surface also. Looks pretty good, huh? Right. We'll have to decide here pretty quick what we want to put on these flyers that are going to go out to the hobby shops. Mm -hmm. Because Dave, I'm going to have Dave draw them up. Good idea. Now that we know a date. It's the most sophisticated radio I've ever seen. It must be. Jeez. It's a button for every, That's every right. fingernail, finger, <laughs> toe. All the engine servos moving. There's your flap here. Yeah, that looks great. Huh? Watch these flaps come down. Oh, yeah. Oops. And the elevator. That's good to know. Rudder. Sure looks good from here. Everything's working. There it is, gentlemen. Hello. I like the number? You know, we finally get to meet in person. I said, you Oh, hi. How are you? Uh, well, I've talked to you several times over the telephone, but it's the first time I've ever met you in person. Now these were the daddy's engines? <laughs> no, we uh, changed the engines to quieter engines. We started up your dad's Four engines times. and they were before mufflers were they really were nice and they were really loud. Is your mom getting all ready to come? Yeah, all my brothers and sisters are coming. Oh my. And most of their spouses and children. That's what Daddy's license plates used to say on his car. H-1? Uh-huh. XF-11. Then he had, because he had both planes on it, on his license plate. We thought maybe we'd put him in there, but we've got to seal this down ahead of time. We get a replica of Howard Hughes, the one of those old dolls, and make sure it's hollow, pour Daddy inside <laughs> Howard Hughes, and put him in the cockpit. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, I'd rather see it get this far than sit in my mom's garage and never do anything. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, if it crashes, it crashes, but at least it was attempted. Yeah. On the whole, I'm, I'm really impressed with it. I just hope it flies. It's just that I never thought I'd see it in this stage. <laughs> <laughs> it just looks great. Bye, Cindy. It's good seeing you. It's good seeing you again. Yep. I will see you out there. What screws? What do you have for? Well, let me guess. You're getting ready to paint. I hope. How can you tell? This is a <laughs> red letter day when we paint.
that's the front turn. Go to right, right. And left, right, left, right. We got the cross bowl too. We have over 650 man hours in it because I've kept very close track. Rudder I worked on at home, Jack worked on the ailerons at home, uh, Dave Butler worked on the cockpit cover at home, George Eisenberg made the cows at home, so we're probably approaching a thousand hours. <laughs> I could have put one more in there. There's only, what, seven there, right? Is next week we're going to put this thing in the water and start the motor. Okay. So we're not going to be sanding for two more weeks. Hell, I don't know. I'm just <laughs> messing with these yeah. little yeah. bitty yeah. nuts. Yeah. Uh. Where's that image manual at, Steve? We already went through that with the lady. It may not get off the water and it may crash. And she understood that and that was acceptable. Steve, could you go back? Go back. You can go back. There, I'm holding Steve, it. Are you pushing down? Yeah, I'm pushing down. Right? Yeah, Steve's holding. Let up, Steve. How much have we got? It's going to take some nose weight. Drop or underneath. Or, or, there we are, gentlemen. That's balanced now. There it is. I'll be happy to see this thing lift off the water. So yeah. Why? My impression is that it's ready right now. Ready for what? To fly. Oh, yeah, got that. That's right. How much did it take? Yeah. Ready on the Oh, I think it was get, getting ready to go on that step. Yeah. Let's try it again. I'll see if I can't get the tail up and uh, get it up on the step. Battery is dead. Shut it down, Wendell. <laughs> <laughs> Wind's coming up. So is the sun lightning. Well, I'd say we dry it off and call it home. Okay? We're shortening the floats so that they're out of the water more and not digging in. See, here's, here's that picture. Yeah. One, one's out, one's in. See this one, see this one dragging over here? Yeah. And this one's completely out. I want to get that out of there so it can dry before we try to fix it. Well, well, it's four I'm pulling this out. Well, we got time to get it. Well, here it is the day before the float fly. And we're still making major <laughs> modifications. 60% chance of flying and 40% not.
Uh, there's a 50 percent chance that it may. <laughs> I'm correct either way. <laughs> We're putting a half inch dowel rod in, in the front and a uh, quarter inch plywood on the back spar. Looks like it's vertical. Yeah. Yeah, yeah looks pretty good. Why don't you make yourself useful and find the end of that tape? <laughs> Perfect. Ready on the right, ready on the left. I have a sneaking suspicion the way the tail's danging down, we got water in the tail. Well, it's not going to fly in its present state. We've got to put more weight in the nose or figure out if there is water in the tail. One of the two is very noticeable when you're taxiing. It's the tail's way down in the water. Yeah, the tail is right in the water. I don't want to fly with a real tail, tail heavy condition. Let's take it home. Dry. One syllable is dry. Very close. I think that's all we got to put in there on this one so we can determine which way it's going. Okay. Can we go home? We're done, except we're done. What well, more can we say? Yep. We're off the big day. Yeah, I'd say at eight we'll be there for sure. Glad it's finally here. You got your papa with you? So Mom clean? has papa. Yeah, yeah, he's in. Marvin's in. It's, yeah, the, the little blue bag in there. Take a see a bag in there. Right now. That's the man that uh, designed it and started building it. That's uh, a little bit of Dad's ashes in the plane. Going to make the flight. Take the heat As you're probably aware, this morning we're going to attempt to fly this Spruce Goose, uh, which uh, was first started to be built by uh, Marvin Lewis up in Netherlands. Those of you who had ever been to Marvin's Gardens would have seen it. Uh, in uh, the bar at his restaurant. The Boulder Air Modeling Society, uh, through the benefit of the uh, family of Marvin Lewis, uh, is finishing the aircraft and getting it ready to fly. Big day. Exciting, nervous, but it's about time. It's been a long time coming. I'm glad somebody did take the plane and finish it, though. I'm, I'm real happy that they did. My dad would have appreciated it. Peanut. Look at Grandma. Aubrey. Yep. Saw it daily and was with him daily for a lot of the starting of it and everything. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's almost as important to me as it was him, I think. Bernard Lewis. They call me Bernie. You look so much like my daddy. I didn't think we'd ever see it this far. I'm uh, glad it's here. I want to watch it. I want to see it fly. And Mar would. this is the day he was waiting for. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
to float right up again. Yeah. 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 For the uh, boat. I can remember uh, going into the restaurant and he had all these parts laying out on a couple of saw horses. And anyway, I'm sure glad to see that he's got it going. And Marv was a good friend of mine, and I saw a lot of work done on that end, on that plane. It's gonna fly like a bird and sting like a bee. It's gotta fly. <laughs> Either that or we had it. <laughs> I'm packing my bags and moving to Australia if this thing don't get off the ground. I would like to want to introduce um, the Lewis family, if they can raise their hands, because I don't know where they are right now. <laughs> I have to ask everybody to try and quiet down while Bri Brianna tries to play this song uh, for Marvin. Now the wings of your dream ride to wings. I only wish you were here beside me right now to see the wings of your dream from the sky. Right? One engine's trouble enough, let alone eight. <laughs> See, these engines are cantankerous. I think it'll fly beautiful. They do. The original Spruce Goose flew. Yeah, it flew. The eight engines. We're going to have to synchronize the throttles. I might just have to build one of these. This is um, obviously a scale model of the Spruce Goose. For those of you who may be unaware of what the Spruce Goose was, it was a very large cargo plane that after its attempted flight resided in Long Beach, California. It is now in Portland. Marvin Lewis, a gentleman up in Netherland, um, got very attached to this. So Eileen Lewis um, gave us the opportunity to finish this off and fly it in his memory, and that's about what we're about to attempt to do. The person who really spearheaded this project uh, is Wendell Wickstrom. Wendell, you can raise your hand. Our pilot in command today is Mr. Steve Croft, and I think we all need to wish him a big part of luck here. Any final words? She'll never fly, Orville. <laughs> <laughs> We've had it in the water about three times, but we haven't tried to take it off because I think one of the promises to the family was that we wouldn't try to take it off until they were here, and they're here today. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started.
Stopping didn't bother me at going. I'd have took it on off the seven if it had been me. So it might. Um, fear, actually. Fear that it wasn't going to be able to fly. Because I know they're going to fix it by faith in all of them. Contract. It came off the water. <laughs> that's all we had to do. Well, that's all we wanted. We really wanted it to fly, of course, but uh, that was kind of amazing that it even got up. 
And as soon as it got airborne, I noticed that I didn't have a whole lot of elevator control. So it was difficult just to get it uh, semi-level for flying, and finally it just still didn't have the control I needed to fly it. So the inevitable consequences was it hit the water. <laughs> I don't think we heard it. I can't see any damage here at all. It looks good. Unbelievable. Yeah. Didn't think it would ever happen. No. Can't even, don't even know what to say right now. Just sort of choked up. It was just such a wonderful feeling. The whole thing made it worthwhile that Dad was on the plane or whatever it did. The dream came true. I told Steve, I said, you have one heck of a co-pilot with you. Ah! They made it. <laughs> just like the original. It taxied. It got off the ground. And that's all we cared about. That was our, our goal was accomplished. Because it did that fluid bubble, we figured that too, that you know, was Howard on one side and Marv on the other, giving it an extra goose. Awesome. It was so cool. Happiest moment in my life. Of my life. So far. Dad would have been proud. He did a great job finishing it. Steve did a real good job flying it. Too cool. He did everything we wanted it to. It flew. It did. It did. It like that went up. Blood in my knee. Yeah. It went up. Thank you. Thank you. Can I, pardon? Can I kiss him over that Yeah, you may kiss it. Kiss it quick. Not a girl. <laughs> Looks in pretty good shape. Scale-wise, I think it went higher than the original. <laughs> I think scale-wise, it went farther than the original. <laughs> so the only problem we had was we couldn't get it down <laughs> like the original. It took a pretty good bump out there, but it looks like it's pretty good shape. They say that it uh, cracked the fuselage, and I think it cracked the left wing. But there's not a lot of damage to it. I think it's probably the best moment of my life. Especially since everyone said it would never fly. Just to see it lift up even a foot would have just done me justice altogether. The best moment of my life just now.